This is a part two message, building on last week, talking about moving mountains. And man, does Jesus <laughs> throw down the gauntlet, throw down actually some incredible news. Depends how, how you look at it. Either a massive challenge that can be scary and overwhelming, or wow, this is some incredible news that as a follower of Jesus, I have the privilege I get to walk into as I get to know my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But essentially, Jesus says that if you are not desiring for, longing for, fighting for, pressing on to see mountains move in and through your life, then you're settling for far less than what Jesus has for you. Yeah. I mean, it's just an incredible thing. And we want to get real practical today and, 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 and talk very honestly because when you get to scriptures like this that are so big, I mean, let's be honest, it's sometimes easy to unintentionally dismiss them and just think, oh, that was just for Jesus. Oh, that was just for the disciples. Oh, that was just for somebody else, not for me. So I want to real quick back up to the, the scripture in Mark 11 we were looking at, and then we're going to spend the bulk of our time today digging into another passage in Mark that is a perfect example of the kingdom principle that Jesus is teaching in Mark 11. So quickly reviewing. In Mark 11, 20 to 25, Jesus and his disciples are going back and forth from the temple. It says they passed by in the morning. They saw a fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered him, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Wow. So much there, and I'm tempted because I love this passage so much to kind of start rehashing everything from last week, so I'm going to try to do a little self-control and Don't keep it to two minutes. A lot of people were here. I'll hash two minutes. Here we go. So what does a withered fig tree really have to do with this grandiose claim that Jesus lands on that says, ultimately, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe you've already received it, past tense, and then it will be yours. And there's a really important framework to put on to our lives. And it's this, that Jesus uses the moment, that moment, to essentially say, well, hey, you guys, you disciples here, you're impressed that by my words, a fig tree is withered, but God's goal for your life is that you would so grow in your faith and your trust through that intimacy with God, your faith in his character, that you guys are going to be the ones that de make declarations that move mountains. I mean, it is an incredible, starting, startling passage. And what we want to focus on to help relieve some of that burden is that this is a goal. We have to see this as a kingdom goal that God has for us that we are growing into. And that right there relieves so much pressure. Because if we see this as a command, if you will, that, hey, you're supposed to do this right now and be here right today, and then we try it and we're not, let's be honest, it's very defeating. Right? First time you come up against a mountain, and you're like, mountain, move! And it doesn't happen, all sorts of, of tensions and insecurities and fears and inadequacies rise up. And, and most people then just conclude, well, for some reason or another, this is not for me. And we quit, if we're honest. And Jesus is not 
going after it like that. He is trying to give us a goal to grow into. A promise that is possible. A goal contains a vision of what is possible and it propels us forward. It says, oh, you know what? Okay, I'm not there yet, but I have the privilege now to take some disciplined action steps to move towards a goal. We've got to see this as a big time, one of probably the biggest goals in Scripture that Jesus says are possible for his followers. But we have to give ourselves grace for the journey. We're not there today, but that doesn't mean quit. This teaching is an invitation into a lifelong journey to grow in intimacy with God so that we grow towards mountain-moving power. And as we see breakthroughs happen, and this is where our discipline comes in, as we take the action steps necessary to say, you know what, I'm willing, God, to be uncomfortable, to take risks, to be bold, to say, I'm not... You don't want me to settle for the status quo, so I'm willing to step out into things. And as we do that, breakthroughs will happen. So what is new territory becomes normal for us. And hopefully you all can look back, and I gave a number of different examples on how, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, as you walk with Jesus, you should be able to look back and be like, wow, What was new to me and scary and in some senses maybe seemed impossible 20 years ago because I had never seen God do it in me or through me is now actually normal. And not that we take it for granted, but that's the whole idea of testimony. That's the whole idea of a relationship with God that's growing is that what used to be new is now normal. And so Jesus is inviting us onto this journey of what's new becomes normal. What's new becomes normal. And the idea is as we walk with Jesus in intimacy with him, grow in communion, grow in our faith, there's this spiraling upward, if you will, in our life where we grow in faith and the mountains start to move. And you can look back 20 years later and be like, wow, that used to be a mountain and it moved. That used to be a mountain and it moved. And we continue on that journey until Jesus calls us home. And so just because we're not, quote unquote, there yet, doesn't mean we quit. Doesn't mean it's not God's will. Doesn't mean it's not possible. It just means we're not there yet. And that's okay. There's grace for the journey. And so I want to take us to a passage this morning in Mark 9 and pass the baton here to my wife where it's a incredible example of all of these things being illustrated. And so what I want to encourage us to see is though there's a specific issue going on of a a young boy who is demonized and ultimately has a, a deaf and a mute spirit that's causing him all sorts of problems. And Jesus interacts with the Father, then he interacts with the disciples. Let's make sure we keep the big picture in mind which is that this is a mindset for all of life. Jesus is not only talking about demons and epilepsy and deaf and mute spirits. He, this is a one example that's a great illustration of this whole prayer goal, this whole mountain-moving goal that Jesus says is our privilege to step into and grow into as followers of of Jesus. So we'll see a specific example, but it's meant to illustrate the big picture point of this kingdom principle about growing in intimacy with Jesus that brings mountain moving power. So let's read it and then we'll do some reflections and observations on it. Do you want to read it, babe? Oh, uh, I actually have something else to say. I felt like God wanted me to release a word real quick before we go into this. Um, So wasn't worship amazing? (laughs) I'm just like, I didn't want it to stop. I know we have a message to do, but I seriously are real close to just throw it. (laughs) Let's just worship the whole time. That's how you Uh, feel every week. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Anyways, but it was amazing. Um, Okay. So I want to read this from Isaiah 40. I feel like... um, 
The presence of the Lord is here right now. This is Isaiah 40, 10. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense, or recom how do you say that? Recompense. Recompense. <laughs> Um, blah, blah, oh, before him. He will tend, this was the verse, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. I felt like that was for us this morning, that he is gathering us in his arms, um, that he's so gentle that he's so kind, that there are no, it, he's not a father who rebukes us for not having the faith. He's not a father that slaps us on the hand. He's the father that pulls us into his arm and he walks with us and he takes us on an adventure and he gives us new strength and he puts new breath in our lungs and he gives us new eyes to see, his eyes to see. Instead of, instead of looking at things the way that the world sees it with our natural eyes, he gives us his eyes and he tells us to call it out. And I feel like today he is bringing strength, that there's a transition, that where even um, there's places where we've been knocking for a while, where we've been wanting that faith, or we've been wanting that mountain moving power, or we've been wanting to walk in prophetic words to release them to people out on the street. I feel like there's grace today, and I feel like he wants us to know that, he, that he's a father and he's here that he's holding us in his arms. It's not just for somebody else, that's for us. He died for us. If each one of us was the only person on the planet, he would have died for us. We're his babies. We're his babies. There's no silly junk about being perfect, about not doing things right. Oh, I didn't spend the right amount of time with God, or I didn't do this, or I didn't do that. The blood took care of all of that. It rid us of all of that, and it's the blood is here every day. Amen. The blood wasn't a one-time thing that got us saved. The blood is around us, making us pure every single day. The blood reconciles heaven to earth so that we can have all of heaven on all of earth. And I feel like God is here, and he's just saying, I love you. You're my baby. I'm here to rescue you. And I feel like he wants us to posture our hearts with excitement, joy, and anticipation, and even just in our hearts just to accept that hug from him. And, and if you don't know what it feels like to have a hug, just tell him you want to know. And if that's you, come up for prayer afterwards because God wants to just pour out upon you. And I just know he's going to be pouring out in this place. And I have one more verse. Um, specifically, okay, Habakkuk 3.19. Um, God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me to tread on my high places. So the high places are like the places that are um, like idols like worshipped above God. And, and quite frankly, faithlessness has become a high place in the U.S. Um, I, I bumped into someone recently. Um, I am always asking the Holy Spirit, you know, for divine appointments, um, just to go and pull, just be part of God pouring out his presence on people when I go out, right? And one of the first things that this really sweet girl said was, oh, but but Jesus didn't heal. Be careful of that. You know, so it was about like signs and wonders and stuff. And then Jesus didn't heal everybody. I'm like, oh, where did you get that? Because he was no friend of sickness. And it's kind of like this general thing of we just, there's this natural thing to just make excuses for what we, what the segments of the Bible and the kingdom of God that Jesus brought and told us that we were supposed to walk like him, John 20, 21, that he was, as the Father sent him, so he was sending us. But we make excuses to kind of like make it okay for when we don't see those things happen. We make it, we've made it, America has made a grand theology of excuses. Yes. And do you know what that does? It takes us out of the game, and the devil is thrilled because his kingdom comes through our agreement. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. I don't know why he's chosen to part, for us to partner with him and to bring his kingdom in that manner, 
but he loves us. He adores us. He loves to be with us. Even though he would do a lot better job on his own, he wants to do it through us. He's God. That's what he's ordained. And if we opt out and say, oh, well, I guess I prayed a few times and it must not be God's will. And so we then attribute the work of the devil to God. Oh gosh, so bad. I'm not saying our hearts are bad. I'm just saying the devil is thrilled when we have hopelessness and a hope deferred and we give up and we opt out and we step off the playing board and we step out of the ranks of the army and we give up our fight because he's won. And I got news for you today. Today, God is renewing our minds, according to Romans 12, where there are places that even subconsciously, and I'm talking me too, I am never exempt from the, from the word. I want more God. I need more God. I need more transformation of my mind every single day. Quite frankly, that's the key to walking in this. It's just a transformed mind. But I really believe that there are strongholds that will be crumbling today in our minds, that there is a revolution of the kingdom of God brought in such sweetness by this heavenly father who carries us in his bosom like baby lambs. Okay, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> now on to the... Was that your intro? That was, my... <laughs> that was a fresh word that was beautiful. No. of what he's doing. No, that's it. That's it right there. You want to he, read this and go in? You want me to read it? Uh, what do you think? You want to read it and then I'll... I'll read it and then you just... I'm feeling just re like Release some fire on it. There we go. I'm just like, Holy Spirit. All right. Mark 9, 14 to 29. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing, arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. And he foams and he grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out. And they were not able. And Jesus answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when Jesus saw him, excuse me, and when the spirit saw Jesus, immediately it convulsed the boy and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. A lot going on there. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go into the Greek first of that? Nope. Okay. Just release some fire. <laughs> and I'll... Uh-oh. For that. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> okay. Hmm. I don't know if I can do that. Just kidding. <laughs> This is one of my favorite verses. Um, we were going over it last night, and I just really wanted to dig into the Greek because I felt like there was some more there. Um, so I want to focus on a few or certain parts, a few parts at a time. Um, 
Should we do this part first? Yeah. Okay. So the verse 21, and Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, um, that that word there, can, that was that dunamis? Yeah. Or okay. Dinah. Yeah. Dinah. So the Dinah, which one's like the root word? Dinah. Okay. Dinah. Um, the word for power in um, in the Bible, Dinah, dunamis, there, there are different, you know, Con- conjugations. Um, that's that word right there, if you can. So what he's saying is, if you have the power, if you have the power, right? So he's saying that. Um, <clears throat> hold on, let me. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. So Jesus, if you have the power, help us, okay? So... Jesus said to him, so this is almost like an, a loving, indignant phrase, if you can, so Jesus, if you can, that's almost like kind of rhetorical, but he's making, but he's saying, if you can, well, that's not the issue if I can, because that word there, when he says, if you can again, that was the same word, dyna, dunamis, power, if, if, so he's saying, if I can, that's not the issue. If I have the power, that's not the issue. And he puts the power back in his hands, retraining him, teaching him to press and to grow his faith. And the next thing he says is, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. And was possible? Would it possible? Yeah, it's the same word. Okay, now what's interesting is, Possible is the same word. Possible is the same word, the power word. All things are possible. All things are power possible to the one who believes. So what he's doing is he's pointing at us at a new way. It's not about begging God. It's not about a matter of, oh, God, please, if you, or it's not if he can either. If he has the power, it's not about, oh, but will you, will you have compassion about, on us? The I am is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is never a friend of sickness. He is always releasing hope. He is always bringing his kingdom. Anything that stands, anything that stands in opposition to what is in heaven belongs under his feet. And he always wants to release the kingdom over it. Anywhere where you have been destroyed and oppressed, he wants to bring victory. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the posture is I believe and to keep believing because sometimes the mountains are bigger. Sometimes they don't crumble with one prayer or 10 prayers or even 10 years of prayers. But we never let go of his hand because his heart is always to conquer the work of the enemy and to bring his kingdom. And if in faith, if in disappointment, because that's the root of faithlessness, it's a lack of hope, it's a hurt, it's this hasn't happened. If in that we let go of the hope, the very bridge that brings heaven to earth in our lives is obliterated. Okay, your turn. (laughs) (laughs) I told you she liked this passage. (laughs) No, but this is so practical because there's in this, in real life, does, doesn't this hit in the sense of we're seeing a a mountain in front of us and it might be a problem like for this father who says he's struggled under the oppression of this real life problem that that has its root uh at, at the work of the enemy and it's so painful and he's tried everything and what do you do and that's where jesus comes in and i and i love her phraseology of he is Jesus is wanting to shift mindsets. This person, and this is us, the Father's coming saying, Jesus, do something. 
If you can't have compassion, it's like the both, are you able and are you willing? Would you please, if you could do anything, have compassion on us? And Jesus is bothered by that. <laughs> and he flips it back, and he's trying to transform the mindset. And he's saying, no, 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 no. It's not about if I can or if I want to. That is not the issue. It's a given. He, exactly. He's, so the, the shift in the mindset is Jesus is saying, no, that, that's supposed to be the given. If you know the heart of the Father, you will accept it as a given that his will is to heal your son. That's a given. And so, therefore, shift the mindset and say, what does Jesus say? Everything is possible to the one who believes. But that's really uncomfortable, <laughs> right? So here, here's a few things, a few observations along the road. What we see from Jesus' interaction with the boy, if you're wanting to lift note this here, is that the mountain that's not moving is not because it's God's will. Jesus puts the ball in the Father's court and says, all things are possible for the one who believes. So if we want to go back to kingdom goals, this is a perfect illustration of the truth that Jesus' goal, test it out here. See if this feels like this is the right interpretation of the story that's going on. Jesus' goal for the boy's father and for the disciples, which interestingly is highlighted, the disciples' side of the story is highlighted in the Matthew passage more. This one, the father's story is highlighted, but for both of them, it's the same. Jesus' goal for the boy's father and the disciples is this. Keep growing in faith until the mountain moves. There's nothing in here that says, sorry, you're suffering under oppression and evil. That's God's will. Deal with it. It's keep growing in faith until the mountain moves because you can know the heart of the Father. That's a given. God can, and his will is yes. He is willing. He desires to see his kingdom break in greater measure in your life in every aspect of evil that is there. Everything that is not lined up with the goodness of heaven, God's will is a transform it, and then Jesus brings us into the equation. And says, our part is to keep growing in faith until we see mountains move. Now, Jesus gets frustrated here. And that's interesting. He's frustrated. He says, oh my gosh, how long do I have to bear with you, faithless generation? Those are strong words. So what is going on? Although it's hard to hear that Jesus is frustrated, you can flip it around. And you can see that the frustration on Jesus' part, he's frustrated with his disciples, primarily, I would say, I would argue, and you go to the Matthew passage, it shows that. But the frustration reveals something beautiful. That Jesus knows what is possible for them. Mountain-moving power. And he can feel in them that they are willing to settle for less. Think about it this. If you're a good parent, you're a good grandparent, when do you get frustrated with your kids? Do you get frustrated if you see them fail at something that you know they have absolutely no capacity for? You shouldn't. <laughs> That's an unhealthy, right? It's like, oh, yeah, my kid's a junior in high school. He's taking the SAT, and he does all this prep work and everything, and he misses two questions and doesn't get a perfect SAT score. What's wrong with you, kid? Step it up. That would be bad parenting. But if my kid says, you know what? He wants to go to college, and he decides to not put any study effort. He decides to stay out till 3 a.m. the night before the test. He rolls in there on two hours of sleep, kind of puts a blindfold on, and just kind of checks the box like this. I am going to be frustrated because God has given you a capacity so much greater. And for your own good, I am going to be frustrated with you and say, come on, man. You can do so much better. Your life will be so much better if you don't just give up and settle for one hour of sleep, blindfolded, checking random boxes. Your life could be so much better. That's an appropriate frustration. 
That's what Jesus has. He's not frustrated because he's some mean taskmaster that likes to just be like, oh, man, you stink. No. He's frustrated when he knows what we are capable of and says, man, I love you too much to let you settle. So we can take this frustration that Jesus has as good news of what Jesus truly knows is possible for us. This is not impossible. If he was frustrated at us for something that is impossible that we could never possibly live into, he would be that bad dad. But he's not. So even though this can be a challenging word, the frustration reveals that this is something that Jesus truly knows and believes. As we walk with him, we can grow into mountain-moving power. And there's two things for me that show us the grace on the journey. One is that we can step into this being way far below mountain moving power, we can step into this and it doesn't have to be scary because of what Don mentioned 10 minutes ago. The blood of Jesus covers us. So we are perfect in his eyes. And this stepping into this journey is not to earn his love in any fashion. That is sealed by the blood of Jesus. We are children of God. Because he lavished his love upon us when we didn't deserve it. When we were enemies running away from him, he loved us the same then as right now. It's the blood of Jesus that covers and makes us perfect. So our identity is already secure. It's already done. It's already won. I'm good. He loves me. I'm awesome. I'm kind of his favorite. That's what you should all think about yourself in God's eyes as a beloved child of God. You've already won. So that's not what this is about. And secondly, now... Wanting to step into the fullness of what we have capacity for because it's so awesome and exciting and life transforming to partner with him and see mountains move. There's grace for the journey in this context. After everything Jesus said, the father said, he got the message and he said, I believe. And what's next? Help my unbelief. And I kind of imagine Jesus like with a little like twinkle in his eye and a little wink. He's like, that's good enough. There it is. There's the grace for the journey. That yes, we want to be growing into that mountain moving faith. But even in that imperfection along the way, miracles happen. So there's grace for the process. But ultimately, Jesus calls them to keep seeking, keep hungering after, keep pressing on, keep running the race. That's part of like, you see all these verses that Paul talks about a lot, Hebrews, writer of Hebrews, probably a disciple of Paul. When you start talking about mountain moving faith, now these verses about pressing on, man, they, 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 they take on a whole new reality. Because the whole idea is, you're not there yet, I'm not there yet, you're not there yet, we're not there yet, and that's okay. You just don't give up. That's the point. That's the main thing. Just don't quit and give up with the status quo of unmoved mountains. There's no place for that as a follower of Jesus. And so now these verses where you have like, run the race with perseverance. What does that mean? It's going to get challenging. It's challenging to look at the same mountain over and over and keep declaring it to move and, and wrestling with it's not yet there. I'm not, yet, I'm not there yet. It's not moving. I guess my faith's not there. Maybe the community's faith. I don't know exactly all the mystery of it. I can believe Jesus. He says it's God's will to move that mountain. So that's, there's the tension. That's the tension right there. That's like, oh, that's hard. So you know what? I'm going to quit. That's a typical response. Or we just, it must be God's will. Ugh. And you know what? Every time you say that, you are way outside of Jesus. Are you partnering with the devil? Or the, devil <laughs> and the devil wants us to believe. Your the, turn. Mm. <laughs> the devil, this is so huge. 
The devil wants us to believe that he is not a good father because our faith is what births the reality of the kingdom of God on earth. And if he can shut that down and make us agree with the lie that he's not a good father, then he can effectively shut down the kingdom of God being birthed through us. The devil wants to shut you down. Don't partner with the devil. Shut him up. Shut up, devil. Ha ha. God's good. He loves me. Just because I've been dealing with this sickness for a long time, it doesn't mean it's not his will to heal it, to heal it, to heal it now. And I continue to agree with him. Thank you, Jesus, that your blood paid the price and that I'm healed. Hallelujah. Ha ha. Bye bye, devil. And you can watch me praise. <laughs> this is exactly what happens in our kitchen too so just there's there's no secrets here <laughs> I, was, I was just thinking this is how we are at home yeah, just yeah. back it so let's let's essentially close with this no 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 <laughs> i knew that i knew that was not going to go over well no no this idea and you can take it and okay. talk as long as you want with it <laughs> to move Forward in the ideas, there's this place where Jesus leaves us in 929 of Mark where he says, the disciples are talking privately, and they say, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind, which is a very interesting word, it's the word genos, where we get the word kind of like the genome, so different kind of, almost like species, that realm. So this kind, this type, cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So he, obviously, the disciples, if you follow Mark, they've cast out a number of demons before. They've healed a number of sicknesses. And so in some sense, they've grown in their faith to move certain mountains. Yet here's the reality Jesus is talking about. We have to see this. Some mountains are bigger than others. Some mountains have more spiritual darkness at their roots than others, and therefore, they are harder to move. So just because you've seen a mountain move once doesn't mean that all mountains are created equal. They absolutely are not. That's Jesus' point. And so that's another layer for us of encouragement that just because we try and the mountain doesn't move, we don't quit and we don't just say it must be God's will. No, the reality is it's probably a more powerful rooted darkness. It's exactly what Jesus is saying. And then we go into the point, the solution, Jesus says, is it can't be driven out, this kind, by anything but prayer. And we're going to, we believe what Jesus is pointing to is that's a, a lifestyle of intimacy with the Father. The disciples prayed. Because the disciples pray. Go for it. Yeah. So the disciples already prayed. And to cast out the demon. To cast out the demon. And it didn't work. Right? And they come and they ask, why didn't it work? And his answer to them is, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. In other, uh, in Matthew's version, it says, prayer and fasting. And the point is that he is referring to a communion and a growing of power and intimacy with the Lord so that they can bring that power, so they can bring that breakthrough. So it's just interesting because it's not, oh, well, this, you can only cast this out by prayer. They did pray. Yeah. He wasn't saying, oh, just pray and it'll happen. He's encouraging them to go deeper, to get stronger. You know, come back in the ring. Don't throw your gloves away. Don't make excuses for why you can't beat that enemy. Because he paid for it. He paid to bring the kingdom over every single place where the enemy reigns. 
And again, in, in that, in, as we do that, we rest in the completed work of Christ. This is not about our identity. And I think that's where for a lot of people it can get painful because it can be like, oh, well, I'm not there yet, it, you know, so therefore I'm bad. And I just, you start to beat yourself up. And again, that's not, that's not the perspective of Jesus. It's just, you are where you are. You're covered by the blood of Jesus. You're loved and forgiven. And so, but God's designed you to be a part of it. And so that's just how it is. And so grow in that journey. He's encouraging us. He calls the disciples to continue to seek that life, that lifestyle that he models with the Father of prayer, fasting, that faith-building communion with God. And as that intimacy with God grows and you know God's character, your faith in him increases. And as that, so does the mountain-moving power. One other important aspect with that is there are some mountains that are not meant to be moved alone. Or can't be moved, or can't be moved alone. Jesus said it like this, Matthew 18, 19, and 20. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything that, the, that you ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So again, I mean, talk about, w wow, big promise. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. And this is just a beautiful picture that we are meant to move mountains in community. Don't try to do it alone. For many people, that's a problem right there. They keep trying to move mountains on their own when they're meant to be part of a body of Christ or a team that moves mountains together. So it's about communion and it's about community. Maybe if there's anything we're saying today, if you remember those two words about moving mountains, it's about communion and about community. And that we stay on that journey together. Yeah, and, and that's also a, an encouragement for vulnerability. Um, you know, I've seen over and over again, a lot of people's uh, worth is in, falsely, is in what they've done. And, and, you know, a lot of us with how we grew up, you know, there can be almost like a performance mentality where you just kind of feel like, oh, well, I don't have the faith or I have this problem and I, I have this addiction. And God wants you free. And there's no condemnation. He didn't, he, he didn't um, condemn the woman who, you know, did all that sleeping around. He just loved on her. Same for you. Same for me. You know, and I have that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll actually. So we're doing like a sozo training for our leaders so that that can be something that we can launch here. And um, so one of the things that God spoke to me, one of my issues was, was perfection. Eh, that'll stick. And, but it's, and, and it wasn't a conscious thing. It was actually something that he showed me. It was like from the womb when I was a baby that I actually heard something in the household and something kind of went into me because both my parents loved me no matter what. It wasn't from my parents. Um, but it was, it, it was pretty crazy. And then I felt like he even showed me this picture. This has been a process. You know, it's not just like a one and done. You do one inner healing and you're done. It's a process. You're transforming to glo from glory to glory. We're like layers of an onion. You know, he goes deeper. Um, but anyways, that perfection, I felt like he showed me one time. You're just, you're try you almost like I try to be all you know, like in his word and put together when I come to him. And he told me, I died for you so that I could hold you when you're dirty. He died for me so he could hold me when I'm dirty. And it's so important. I think we all have some kind of issue with either perfection or not feeling good enough where we disqualify ourselves, where there's some um, part of us that is finding feels like our worth is tied up in whether or not we're perfect. And because of that, we're not going to be vulnerable in safe places with the body of Christ. You know, it's kind of like, let that hell be buried. He died because we're not perfect. We're never going to be perfect. We're his babies. And he died so he could hug us when we're dirty. And you don't need to be afraid of condemnation. And quite frankly, if anybody condemns you, then come talk to us, because that's not biblical. <laughs> it's not biblical. And you don't need to be afraid of that. We have amazing leaders here. We have amazing people here. But there's so much that God wants to unleash. But if we're not vulnerable and we don't open up and we don't let people into those places, then we'll be alone and we don't have 
And we what? And the mountains won't move. Yeah, and the mountains won't move. And he wants to move them. He wants to move them. I'm done. Okay. Um, I have one quick thing, and we're not going to go into these verses, but a lot of times when people, um, you know, in American theology, when people try to justify why God hasn't done something or why he doesn't heal all the time, you know, um, they will, it'll, there'll be junk about how Jesus didn't heal anybody. Well, Jesus was demonstrating his life as a man on the earth so that we could follow him as an example. Every sickness he came in contact with, he brought the kingdom of God. He was never a friend of sickness. People use a general thing. Well, he didn't heal everybody, and it's like, well, he was a man. He healed every sickness he came in contact with. He was an example to us. So the next one um, would be Job, and then the next one would be 2 Corinthians um, 12, when Paul asked the Lord to remove the thorn in his flesh. I'm not going to go into this. He's gone into it in past sermons. The thorn was not a sickness. It was the Jews. There you go. The thorn was not a sickness, it was the Jews. He can give you a great sermon on that, but it wasn't a sickness. God didn't say, my grace is sufficient and say sick. <laughs> That's an interpretation from the devil. <laughs> um, just at, and, and we have to be cautious with verses as well because of, we need to just be cautious of interpretations. Um, and I will say this, the original Greek in many times was interpreted by patriarchal societies. So there are a lot of verses as well on women, and there are many verses that have been misinterpreted in English to give us a false representation of what Jesus actually said. Okay, Job. We're not going to go into Job. We could do a long sermon on Job, but I love Bill Johnson's answer. People go, what about Job? What about Jesus? What about Jesus? Okay, why are we so quick to look for anything that will veto the words of Jesus and make us partner with the devil and make us helpless and make excuses for why we're not seeing the kingdom of God? Uh. Sorry, I'm hot. Is it hot in here? <laughs> but, but, but we could go... <laughs> No, I'm just saying I'm not into just glossing over things and not going into things in a very in-depth scriptural analysis. And we could do that with Job, just like we, we can do that with 2 Corinthians 12. We don't have time for that right now. So I, that's why I'm leaving it with, what about Jesus? Amen. All right, well, let's pray on that note. <clears throat> and this is a great opportunity to go to life groups this week. Because we know this message, there should be plenty to process, right? To, this, is, this stirs us up. And so that's the whole idea is go to life groups and process this together. How does this hit real life? Go deeper into God's word and apply it to our lives. So one, one final feeling. thing and then we're praying. It's final, it's final but it's so important. Um, hold this, I got to get to my verse. Oh, I just lost it. I think I have it memorized anyway, so it doesn't matter. Sorry. Me, it's stuck. I spilled on this and it's the page is stuck. Second Corinthians three. Okay. How do you not give up? How do you not give up when it gets hard? How do you not give up? When the mountain is so big and when it's been ten years, when it's been fifteen years, when it's been twenty years, how do you not give up? So this is my answer. How do I not give up? I've been fighting, standing in agreement for my healing for um, 21 years. A long time. A long time. How do I not give up? You look in his eyes. You look in his eyes, 2 Corinthians 3. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed as we look at him. We are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. You have to hold tight. You have to always come to him. You have to bring your disappointments. When you're upset, don't shove it under a rug. Tell him, Daddy, I'm mad at you. I know 
It's not your fault, and I know you care about me, but I've been praying so long. Sometimes I feel upset that you haven't come through for me, and I know that's bad theology, but I just need to get it out with him. Change my heart. Let me see what you see. Let me declare what is in your kingdom so that I can bring it to earth. But stay close. That's the key. It's stay close. It's look at his eyes. It's continue to be transformed. Romans 12, 2. Our minds need to be transformed. We need to continually press in. So the core of how do we stay burning is abiding in the vine. It's abiding. It's never letting go. It's eyes on him. Eyes on his eyes. Hands in his hands. For me, I picture myself dancing with him. Eyes on his eyes. Hands in his hand. My feet are on his feet. And I never let go. And don't let go in the hard days either. When you feel bad, when you feel hopeless, when you haven't spent time with God in a week, because it's just been a hard week, he's right there. Amen. He's right there, and he wants to hold you when you're dirty. Let's pray. Dance like David